This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hi friends, this is Dr. Deepak Meghur. Today I'll be taking you through a case where I had an intraoperative transzonular vitreous prolapse which I was not anticipating at the beginning of the surgery and let's see how it turned out. So I begin the surgery. This is a seemingly innocuous looking case. He's a 65 year old gentleman who has the grade 2 to grade 3 nucleus, a well dilated pupil. Doesn't look anything ominous at all. The incisions are made, the capsule is stained. So I puncture the capsule and raise the flap. And as I'm tearing the capsule with my rexus needle, I'm beginning to see these small radial folds along the tearing edge. Now this was a sign for concern and uh, this I thought is something very unusual and I was suspecting anterior zonular weakness. But I never thought it's going to be very alarming. The rexus is done. Uh, the rexus seems to be round, central and appropriately sized. So no issues with that. I'm doing hydrodissection. I tap the lens down and try to nudge it around. I can see the right side of the bag is still sticking onto the nucleus. And it's also moving as a nudge the nucleus. So I thought the hydrodissection needs to be repeated. I repeat the hydrodissection in another quadrant. Again decompress the bag and nudge the nucleus around just to see that the hydrodissection is complete and all the corticocapsular adhesions are broken. Looks better. I'm going to reinflate the chamber with OVD before attempting to rotate the nucleus. Now before rotating the nucleus, I would like to share two important tips here. Number one, position the chopper beyond the rexus margin near the equator of the nucleus. This helps us to get a better torque effect so that we require less amount of physical force to rotate the nucleus. Number two, when you're rotating, press the nucleus down a little bit and then rotate. These two factors ensure that when you're rotating the nucleus, we're not imparting any stress on the already compromised zonules. Gently the nucleus is rotated a couple of times. That's reasonably assuring that it's all right to proceed with a nucleus management. As the superficial epinucleus is being aspirated, time to remember that we're dealing with an eye which has got a bag which might be floppy. So your nucleus division maneuvers and the nucleus aspirating technique has to be gentle and all the techniques have to keep in consideration the laxity of the zonules. So the dividing maneuvers has to be as gentle as possible. The plan is to do a vertical chop maneuver. The phaco tip is buried into the substance of the nucleus. The chopper goes down vertically and then the lateral separation maneuvers are done. Note uh, that I'm very gentle with the lateral separation maneuvers. So I'm not very aggressive in getting a full length crack. The distal half is cracked. That's fine for me. I gently rotate the nucleus. Observe that I'm using both the instrument, the phaco tip as well as the chopper to rotate the nucleus. Again bury the tip, chopper goes down vertically, one attempt and then use laterally separating. I am conscious that I want to ensure that both the fragments are free. At the same time, I am not pulling my second instrument as far as the rexus margin. So I want to ensure that the second instrument doesn't traverse beyond the central 3 to 4 millimeters. So we have got three pieces. Again, the nucleus is gently nudged and rotated round. Time to deal with the second heminucleus. The second nucleus is again divided into smaller fragments and then each of the fragments is then emulsified. And at this point there doesn't seem to be any effect of the zonular weakness which we had noted. The followability is good, the fragments are coming nicely to the tip and each of them is just pulled to the bag and then emulsified. I'm just speeding up the video here just to save some time uh, because it was uneventful. The last piece of the nucleus followed by the epinucleus is removed. I go in with my irrigation cannula just to flush the posterior capsule as I typically do. But I find something unusual. I find that the rexus edge seems to be deformed. And the rexus is not looking round as it was before. I'll just put the clip as when we completed the rexus, it was quite round, but now it looks to be oval. And it is very well identified by the when I turn on the retroillumination mode. So I thought there seems to be something fishy here. I just go back and deepen the capsular fornices by putting in OVD. It looks a little bit better. The change in the shape of the rexus got me thinking. I thought this is because of a zonular weakness. 
So I decided to go and implant the CTR now itself so that it's going to provide the support to the capsular bag and also stretch the equator of the capsular bag. This would help us to prevent or minimize chances of any fluid misdirection which can happen. So that was the idea of going in and implanting the CTR early enough. So I understand, I'm suspecting the zonular weakness in the distal part of the area, that is 3 o'clock. I'm sitting at temporal area, so I'm suspecting the zonular weakness to be in the region between 2 o'clock hours around the 3 o'clock region. So I carefully ensure that the CTR has gone and supported well beyond that area. So immediately once we put in the CTR, the shape of the rexus margin opening also changes. So it was a sigh of a relief and I thought that it was the right step to be done. Now is the time to remove the cortex. I thought it's just a matter of a few minutes and I'm done. And as I'm trying to remove the cortex, I'm noticing that some strands are getting struck into the aspiration port. They're again coming from the distal end and this was concerning for me. So I thought this doesn't look like a cortex, definitely it could be the vitreous strand itself. So at this point I just stop here and then this is quite confident that uh, it is vitreous fibril which is engaging the aspiration probe. So I push the reflux button on and disengage it and pull it out. So as we all know the best way to confirm is to always go ahead and do a injection of diluted trimsunacetate. Because at this point, the poster capsule was fully intact. There's no doubt about it. The only way it could have come is through the zonal weakness, which I was anticipating from beginning. So I go ahead and use the diluted trimsunacetate. I'm injecting 0.1 ml of uh, diluted trimsunacetate. The dilution is about 1 is to 4. That's what we use as a standard. So the trimsunacetate goes in and I'm now irrigating with uh, the BSS. And we can clearly see the tongue-shaped prolapse of the vitreous across the zonules. So time to perform the anti-vitrectomy. So it's quite challenging when to do a vitrectomy for a transzonular migration because when you go through the anterior route there is always a risk of catching the rexus edge or the iris tissue when you're trying to cut very close to the point of entry. So I'm trying to be as careful as possible to do the vitrectomy. Well, ideally one can always go through the past plan approach uh, which would be much more easier to do the job but I need to do again make a fresh entry and go through the past planner region that I have kept it as my second option if I can deal with the vitreous translimbally it would be fine if not then I'll have to go through the past planner route. I'm just trying whether I can uh, deal with this vitreous through the anterior approach itself. So one tip when you're working very close to the anterior capsule or the iris and we're risk of cutting them inadvertently is to use a very low flow rate and vacuum as is being shown here and also use the cut rate in a linear mode. So when you're using a cut rate in a linear mode, the cutter is not vibrating at 2000 or 8000 cuts and it's controlled and we can go and eat uh, the vitreous fiber itself individually rather than being a little bit uncontrolled. So this is one tip which is very helpful when we are working close with uh, some of the structures which we don't want to cut. So once the prolapsed vitreous is taken care of, uh, the cortex is then aspirated. It's quite difficult to see the cortex because the red glow is muddled with the vitreous suspension which has gone into the vitreous cavity. Nevertheless, just by tilting the globe a little bit, you have a glimpse of the red glow and then you deal with the cortex effectively. Time to implant the lens. The bag is inflated with OVD and the foldable single piece hydrophobic lens is gently maneuvered into the bag. Now before closing I want to ensure that the there is no prolapse of vitreous later on. So I go back with my vitrectomy cutter. The irrigating handpiece is held to retract the iris back so that I can visualize well under high magnification and a clear focus. I'm ensuring that what I'm cutting and I'm just keeping on cutting whatever the vitreous is prolapsing out. So it takes a couple of minutes for me to ensure that the prolapsing of the vitreous is stopped now. Again, the trick here to ensure that none of the collateral structures damage, like the iris in the capsule, is to be very sure of where your cannula is and do it in a direct visualization. So here the pupil was very well dilated and also aided by retraction by the second instrument, the irrigating cannula. So I was successful in preventing any damage to any of these, but it will take some time for the vitreous to stop prolapsing. So I need to be a little bit patient and continue to do it. 
And once I thought it is reasonably done, I'm going to inject a little bit of a pilocarp in to bring the pupil down. So the side ports are hydrated and the pupil has come down now. It looks to be round and there's no evidence of any prolapsed vitreous. So while closing, it looks to be fine and I thought that's it. My concern as I'm closing this eye is what if the patient is a steroid responder? We had already checked the, his case sheet for any evidence of any glaucoma or raised pressures. There was none and the optic discs from his previous records were healthy and the pressures were always noted to be uh, normal. Nevertheless, I will be mindful of monitoring the pressure for the next couple of months. So this is the first day post-op picture. The cornea is clear and the uh, patient is doing fine. He's got excellent uh, visual outcome. So to summarize, you never know when we are thrown up with surprises like this. So it was least expected until I did started doing the rexus. The first indication for a compromised annulus is always these linear folds which we see as the around the tearing edge and which is very evident in the area of zonal weakness. But still, you know, you always felt that it might not be such a big enough so that the vitreous can prolapse out. And we also asked history of trauma retrospectively. A patient did not have any history of trauma. So it was a little bit surprising for us. Uh, we never knew why it was prolapsing or because there's no evidence of any pseudo exfoliation as well. But nevertheless, you're always sprung up with surprises, especially in cataract surgeries, and we need to be ready to deal with it. Okay, two questions I would want to answer for myself and for the benefit of all the younger viewers. Now, I detected the vitreous uh, prolapse at the fag end, that is, during cortex aspiration. Is it possible for the vitreous to have been in the antechamber even during phaco emulsification? Well, the answer is, I don't think so, because if the vitreous was there, the followability of the nuclear fragments would have not be good, and it would not have been possible for me to continue with phaco simply because the vitreous fibril would clog the phaco tip, and it would be almost impossible for us to proceed. That's number one. The second question is, if I had inserted a CTR before the nucleus management itself, could it have prevented the vitreous prolapse? Well, I'm not sure. The argument is, as we continue to do FACO, there is always a migration of fluid from the FACO across the zonules, and that will go into the burger space and increase the pressure from behind. That would probably cause the vitreous to migrate anteriorly across the zonules. So that is one hypothesis and probably if I had used the CTR early enough, maybe this problem could have been prevented, but I'm not certain about it. So that was it about this case and hope you found this interesting and I hope you learned something from it. Thank you for watching.